Hey everybody out there, Jim Siegler here. In a few weeks, you're going to hear Dr. Clyde Markowitz discuss the inflammatory causes of myelopathy and lesion characterization as what looks like MS and what's not like MS. On a somewhat related note, I thought we might take this opportunity to review the 2017 update to the McDonald Criteria for Diagnosing Multiple Sclerosis, which was published in Lancet Neurology in December 2017. And if that's not your cup of tea, you might as well just skip on to the next track. I'll give you a second to do that while we play some classy elevator music and this message from our sponsors. The neurology board exam is not the easiest test in the world to take, but it doesn't have to be the hardest. And for a test that costs $2,500, it's not one you want to take twice. You'll probably want to buy a good review book or download some old lectures from residency. But let me tell you that none of this will be as comprehensive as the University of Pennsylvania's 15th Annual Board Review Course. This two-day program in Philadelphia takes place June 4th and 5th of 2018, and it can be attended in person or online. It's intended for graduating residents and fellows, but it also provides an excellent review for those of you planning to recertify. So check out what it has to offer at pinneuroboard2018.com. And if you're interested, use promo code WAVES2018 to get $150 off your registration fee. Again, the code is WAVES, in all caps, 2018. The last update to the McDonald's criteria took place in 2010, the same year that the Affordable Care Act was passed. It has changed, and in some cases saved, American lives. The year that the H1N1 pandemic ended, and the year of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, we could see the aft starboard corner starting to slowly drop into the sea. And by 1022, she was gone. And since that time in medicine, we've made some pretty remarkable progress. We have a new blood test for CJD. We've implemented minimally invasive responsive neurostimulation systems for patients who have intractable epilepsy. And there are novel endovascular techniques for acute stroke. A lot's happened in neurology over eight years. And in multiple sclerosis, we've also added some new drugs, including the first ever highly effective FDA-approved therapy for primary progressive MS, ocrelizumab. But let's just take a step back. Most of these improvements with time are related to treatments. Diagnostic criteria shouldn't have to change all that much, right? Well, let's talk about that. So why did we need updated diagnostic criteria for multiple sclerosis? Well, there are a couple of reasons. And if there's anything that you're going to take away from the show, you should realize that most of them are helpful in making an earlier diagnosis and permitting earlier intervention with disease-modifying therapies. Part 1. Misdiagnosis. MS is a heterogeneous clinical condition, with various initial presentations, imaging findings, and clinical courses. No single test is 100% sensitive or specific. Features on MRI, which were used in the 2010 McDonald criteria, were not specific, and they can be seen in small vessel ischemic disease or prior strokes, migraines, Lyme disease, sarcoidosis, and many other inflammatory conditions. Granted, the 2010 McDonald criteria were not designed to differentiate MS from these other conditions. They were implemented to identify MS in patients who have clinically isolated syndrome, when these other conditions were less likely. The bottom line here is that the MRI is nonspecific unless you've incorporated a variety of pertinent clinical elements, and the lesions are absolutely characteristic of MS. So say you have a patient who's a 19-year-old girl with a history of one week of vision loss from high school, who now has some leg weakness and a small circumscribed enhancing thoracic lesion. You test her CSF for oligoclonal bands, and she has two bands. Now that sounds pretty characteristic for MS, But that did not meet the 2010 McDonald's criteria, for a number of reasons that we're going to talk about. Part 2. Testing other than MRI. Besides the history and the physical exam, which you're going to use anyways in making the diagnosis of MS, regardless of the McDonald's criteria, say the patient has worsening of prior symptoms and heat, the UTOS phenomenon, besides those historical and exam elements, How often are you going to get that LP to look for oligoclonal bands? Like every time, right? And yet, CSF testing is not part of the 2010 criteria for relapsing remitting MS. So in 2017, the expert panel has amended this criterion. Knowing that the presence of bands in a patient with clinically isolated syndrome is highly predictive of a subsequent attack, 
OCBs can now be used as a substitute for the dissemination in time criteria. So you can have relapsing remitting MS if you have a single attack with two or more lesions and oligoclonal bands. This change is huge because now it permits earlier diagnosis and allows for earlier treatment in patients who are at high risk of recurrent attacks. Part 3. The Dissemination in Space Criteria So here's something you might not have remembered from the 2010 McDonald Criteria. If a patient presented with an acute symptomatic brainstem or spinal cord lesion, that lesion would not be counted among the two lesions disseminated in space. Like a patient, for instance, who has a whopping old, non-enhancing periventricular lesion and has a new transverse myelitis with a new enhancing thoracic lesion, that would not have fulfilled the 2010 criteria. But nowadays it does. Say the patient also had CSF testing at the time of their transverse myelitis, something like three bands. Wouldn't matter. Up until 2017, that patient wouldn't have MS and might not have had insurance approval for therapies. But now, those bands would be sufficient to diagnose the patient with MS, even if their thoracic lesion didn't enhance. And each of these features, the locations of those two lesions and the three bands, you know they're all predictive of a subsequent attack. Yet, they were previously insufficient to make the diagnosis. Part 4. Cortical Lesions With advances in neuroimaging, MRIs with greater magnet strength, it's easier for us to pick up on smaller lesions and to determine the presence of more lesions disseminated in space, and we've learned that patients with MS have cortical as well as juxtacortical lesions. But cortical lesions didn't matter in 2010. You could have a cortical lesion, and an enhancing periventricular lesion, and that wouldn't be MS. But now, if you see an old cortical lesion, and it counts just like a juxtacortical one, and that patient also has an enhancing periventricular lesion, this confirms dissemination in time and space. You've made your diagnosis. Part 5. Primary Progressive MS So is there an update to the criteria for primary progressive multiple sclerosis? Yeah. It's a small one, but it's significant. So in 2010, a symptomatic brainstem or spinal cord lesion did not count towards dissemination in time or space criteria, just as they didn't count in relapsing remitting MS. In 2017, now these brainstem or spinal cord lesions do count. So to make the diagnosis of primary progressive MS, you need only one year of progressive symptoms with two of the three following criteria. Bands, just like in 2010, two or more lesions of the spinal cord, and one or more lesion of the brain, either periventricular, cortical, juxtacortical, or infratentorial. So that does it for this episode of the Qantas series on our 2017 update to the McDonald criteria for diagnosing multiple sclerosis. To summarize the basics of what we covered in case you dozed off, in a patient with a typical clinically isolated syndrome who has two or more lesions in space, you don't need dissemination in time to necessarily make that diagnosis. CSF illegal clonal band testing can be used in lieu of the dissemination in time criterion. A second big update for both RRMS and primary progressive MS, the enhancing brainstem or spinal cord lesion can now be counted towards dissemination in time and space, whereas it didn't count back in 2010. But there are some things that haven't changed since 2010. History or clinical evidence of optic neuritis may clinically support your diagnosis of MS, but it's still not part of our 2017 McDonald criteria. Also, when it comes to the radiologically isolated syndrome, where a patient may have one or more asymptomatic lesions of the brain or spinal cord, this diagnosis is unchanged by the new 2017 update. They're still at a relatively low risk of a clinical attack in the future and developing more lesions, but it's unclear whether treating these patients early with disease-modifying therapies is helpful. Anyway, that's it for our show today. Stay tuned in a couple of weeks when Dr. Clyde Markowitz joins me to discuss the diagnostic considerations in patients who present with transverse myelitis. I'll talk to you then. As usual, thanks for checking out our show. Music this week was courtesy of Daniel Birch. I'm Jim Siegler for Brainwaves, signing off.